Hello, YouTube. Dr. Miller here with another book review for you. Another gut book. Um, I know this is such a contentious area because we wade into the world of fad diets. And I know um, that even itself can irritate some of you um, because it's like, well, my diet's not a fad diet. It is the only diet. I'm, I'm going to try to avoid that world. Um, I might make a video on that, though. I don't mind wading into it. I just want to talk about this book. It's called The Mind Gut Connection by Mayer. Um, Emeran, I think is his name, Mayer. It was uh, <clears throat> published, the paperback was published in 2018. I feel like the one I was listening to it, though, I, it was more like 2016, but we'll, we'll go with 2018. <clears throat> I just read, you know, I just, well, I listened to it, okay? I'm going to be honest with you. I read books and I listen to them. Um, I tend to rack up the books a lot faster on audiobook because I have a little bit of a drive. I like listening to the books. Um, so, anyway, I thought I'd share my thoughts with you. I've already read um, The Good Gut by Sonnenberg. Sonnenberg, Sonoran, Sonnenberg, anyway. Um, and so uh, this book is in that same vein of the gut microbiota. There's a lot of interest in this area, of course, of the body and in research. And by the way, if you haven't, I forgot to mention, hey, you can like this video. You can, but you can watch it first. All right. We'll make that deal between us. Okay. And um, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I just put up another video on sets and rep schemes as well. Um, a lot of videos, teaching videos, rants, so forth and so on. Uh, keep adding to the journal club. I think we're on journal club 31. And this is book review 15, 16. I'll go after look when I put the thumbnail up. Anyway, um, smack the bell too because it's just what you're supposed to do if you watch YouTube videos. All right. Anyway, back to this. <clears throat> so reviewed a book on gut health before. And the microbiota is a hot area of the body and research. And um, a lot of promise, of course, because we're seeing connections between uh, gut function and overall health, longevity. Um, and you know, I, th I think the gut stuff gets uncomfortable, uh, ha -ha, uh, because, uh, it feels like a lot of time we're getting a little bit of naturopathic for those of you that don't, aren't in that. And I, I don't, and I'll explain why I'm not either or functional nutrition, things like that. Um, there's parts of that are good and parts of it that I need, we, we need to exercise care. And, um, the microbiota, there's the reason we can, there's some cool research out there about if you do this, you know, if you take lactobacillus at this time and so on and so forth, you can, you can fix your gut. Okay. Now I don't know about that. Um, and this is the reason is because the gut is a complicated, it's a complicated part of the body and the body is complicated. The gut is incorporating so many, um, systems and including one that is so complex, uh, we cannot figure it out. And that is the endocrine system because it operates there's so many inputs and outputs and um, covariants and covariers and uh, you know there's just so many signals going on it's very difficult to make <clears throat> an a to b conclusion and that's that's what i would say is before i review the book is um, i i think the area of the gut microbiota is fascinating obviously i read this book because i was interested in it and i continue to be interested in it i haven't done a ton of reading into the literature on it i'm going to start to do that um, I want to make sure I'm up to date on, because I work with people who have IBS and <clears throat> at least uh, initially, and, or people who just have GI issues. And this book really pointed out the connection between anxiety and, um, you know, a childhood and, and, uh, issues with the gut. And, you know, I've seen that in an anecdotal sense, uh, working with people and it sh should come as no surprise that, um, that's an important part of that being childhood, our experiences or any, any particular, uh, challenges in our life that especially early on, that those would imprint uh, in our formative years and potentially change the way our gut functions all the way through adulthood. All right. But that's, so all that said, I, I, I'm not promoting a, 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 this book as a way of fixing your gut. And I don't think the author is either um, because we don't know enough to do that. And everybody's so, everybody, okay, I guess I could say that. People are, it's, individuals are so different from each other, individuality, that it's, it's difficult to say, well, you just need to do this and um, take this uh, probiotic and it'll just heal your gut, uh, uh, right? We even have a hard time determining um, with some of these kind of commercially available things if if we're really assessing the gut's health uh, or the the gut's um, makeup in terms of its uh, bacterial makeup, right? The actual microbiota. All right. So the book, what is it? So first of all, I would recommend this book for anybody that hasn't done any reading. Uh, or doesn't know anything about the gut microbiota, like you don't know what I'm talking about, or you've just heard some kind of offhand things about the gut microbiome. Um, and, you know, what is this, you know, all this uh, probiotic stuff and maybe prebiotics, right? And, uh, you know, fermented food and, you know, what's, and those are all, I'm not saying those are bad things. I'm just saying, if you don't have any clue where to start, this is a great book. It's an easy read. It's written by an MD doctor, um, gastrointestinal doctor, no, it's ear, nose, and throat doctor. 
maybe an ear is in the throat, doctor. Forgive me if I messed that up. He's an MD, though. But what I like about the book is many times MDs uh, or PhDs um, can get into the, we tend to fall in two ditches. Either we go all art and no science or all science and no art. What I mean by that is um, you get a book written, it's more of, usually some more naturopathic, you know, uh, how to heal your thyroid kind of books. And there's not a lot of research, though, to support what's being said. It's all anecdotal. And that doesn't mean, to, this is where I probably would differ with some people. It doesn't mean the experiences are not valid. It doesn't mean that at all, but it's good to have some research literature to support it. So I put this in the coaching world, the art and science of coaching. Good, good decisions are built on science. Now, you might take some chances, and I mean that in a, not, in a good way, like not reckless, but chances based on your, you know, um, what you know about the research literature. And the same is true um, when it comes to medicine, right? Um, if you've, one of my first experiences with doctors that um, this kind of opened my eyes to was I was giving a presentation on Andrew Dion. This was an undergrad. And I gave it to a collection of a, a group of doctors, and I happened to get there early, and so I was sitting in on their meeting. And, you know, the, the one doctor got up and said, you know, this is my, uh, it was basically a case today, this is so-and-so, I don't know what's wrong with her, I can't figure it out. And it was just like one of those TV movies, right? There was the arrogant doctor at the end of the table, like, was really nice hair, and he was like, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. I could tell all the other doctors didn't like him. Um, but they were trying to figure out what was wrong with this individual, and they offered um, some, some feedback. That's good medicine, in my opinion. It wasn't just one guy going, well, I got it all figured out. Okay, but why were they, where were their opinions coming from? Um, experiences. And where do those, some of those experiences come from? How could they speak the language of medicine? They, they knew what some of the pharmacology was. They knew the research literature, what had been done already in similar cases. That's the art and science of, of anything, and, and including medicine. That's why we say practicing medicine. Um, we should call coaching practicing coaches. Like, you're practicing. Like, you're, you're getting better at it. Okay? And if you're informed, you should get better at it. And so the, I believe, you know, from what I read in this book, it does, the author does a good job of, um, he has a lot of practical experience. And he also cites a lot of literature, which doesn't mean that the literature is good. It just means that he's at least thinking like somebody who's doing the arts and science, um, the art and science of, of, of medicine, practicing medicine. That's what he's doing. So I was impressed with that. Um, the, the connections he made were uh, not... So he used some case studies, which were helpful because it's an easy read that way. Like, you know, he, you know, Sally had this problem and this showed up and then he'd go off on to explaining, um, you know, how this linkage could be here and so on and so forth. So he does a good job with that. Um, I appreciated that he didn't say you should be doing this specific probiotic. It was more general things. And, you know, I can't help but even the other book I read, it falls back into some general patterns again, more active, um, eat as much fruits and vegetables as possible with different colors, right? Polyphenols. As, co- as as possible, um, limit red meat consumption. I, and he says one, you know, he, he cites the Mediterranean diet, which is red meat, uh, once a week. Um, the research literature I've seen is maybe up to once a day, but I'm going to say maybe there it depends on what literature. So a limit red meat consumption. Um, animal fat is seems to be detrimental to health, and many studies support that. Um, but again, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> there's a lot of nuance there, right? I mean, if you're not eating animal flesh in that doesn't promote satiety and therefore you eat a lot of, car- of um, sugar. I know in the comments, you guys can leave all kinds of, well, you're, you know, the carnivore diet is better, but this is where we're getting the diet fighting. And I don't think that's necessary. What I'm saying is there's a balance here. I think that's one thing about the Mediterranean diet. That's um, wonderful. Remember that diet, meaning it's just a way of eating. It's not a fad diet. Um, is that it's just the way people eat the Mediterranean. And this is, I think he's the first author. Uh, well, maybe one other, but it was in a, it wasn't in the nutrition realm. He, and when he said this, I was like, yes, finally, somebody else said this is that when he pointed out the benefits of, of the Mediterranean diet, he talked about the social interaction associated with the diet. It wasn't just, um, you know, fish oil. It wasn't just high fruits and vegetables or in low red meat consumption. It was that people dialogue together. Like the, the, the diet and the, and the lifestyle go together. It's not a, you know, like we can say the Western diet. Well, why is the Western diet um, so much about processed foods? Well, because we're always in a hurry um, and we're lazy. We don't like preparing food. And we have um, the ability just to buy food. It's made for us. Consumerism is 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 um, the name of the game. We, you know, we're exhausted because we work too hard. We stay up too late watching video games or playing video games and watching Netflix. We, right? This is the modern lifestyle, and so as a result, we get a modern diet. Uh, you see people that have kind of went out and started a hobby farm or something. They they haven't just changed their diet. They've changed their lifestyle. Those two things go together. They and that's why it's so difficult for some people. A lot of people, me included, to change their diet is because they don't want to change their lifestyle. It's hard to live um, living a chaotic life, you know, where you're just one event to the next and then um, it's so exhausted you end up just binging and then expect to be able to make uh, 
you know, food for 30 minutes. That's very difficult to do. You have to change your lifestyle. You have to carve out the time in your day to prepare food. You have to carve out the time in the day to exercise. It's not just a, a simple, I'm just gonna change my diet. No, it's a lifestyle change. And that's why it's so hard. That's why it's so hard. So anyway, um, sorry, I got on a tangent there, but I was excited to see that. Like first time I, I, at least that I remember, maybe I'm just old and I can't remember anything anymore, which is entirely possible, uh, that I saw somebody point that out or I've read somebody point that out. That Hey, it's not just the food, it's the interactions associated. And it might've been like a longevity TED talk I heard once and she, the, the author was talking about this. Anyway, so there was that part of it. Um, the, and the, the general recommendations though, weren't, you know, eat the certain, this and eat, you know, it's just eat better or eat, um, a specific type of food. It was, there was a promotion of fermented food, which may have some benefit, but I appreciate it. It wasn't take X amount of this. And he did mention some of the bacteria, of course, like lactobacillus this is the most common did the benefit, but he didn't point out specific foods. He also highlighted what I think, again, important generalities. And we tend to gloss over these generalities, but we don't listen. And that's the important, um, importance of early, the early years. Um, both in the womb and then immediately after birth, immediately after birth, you know, even going through the birth canal, if possible, and the Sonnenberg, Sonnenberg, the good uh, gut, good gut uh, promotes this as well. Um, and that is, you know, vaginal birth is better than C-section just because the baby gets, um, do and get a whole bunch of microbiota in a hurry. Okay. And that's how you start to develop a healthy microbiota. You know, it, it harkens back, harkens, I love that word, it harkens back to, you know, the, this thought, and I just wrote, finished writing a book on um, modern, kind of the way modernity has affected um, our health. I'm going to write another one on this topic because I think it's important. And, um, you know, how we think we know best. And so we sterilize everything, you know, and I'm not, if you're doing these things, for, I'm not accusing you of anything. Don't, don't go down that road. I'm just talking. Okay. And that's what I do best. Um, and so uh, if, if we sterilize everything, we tend to get rid of the good things. So for example, you know, if, um, everybody's going to get a C-section, and I know that's not true, but everybody's going to get a C-section. Uh, every woman's going to get a C-section when she has a baby. Uh, well, you don't get the vaginal birth. You, you miss out on the microbiome. Now, it, it can be saving the mother's life and the baby's life. I, if that was my wife, C-section all day long, okay? But there's ways to maybe be around it, and there's people have, have proposed different ways of then um, exposing that baby to the mother's microbiota immediately. Right? There's ways to do that. Um, you know, but the, the point is that the forced sterilization of everything we've kind of, you know, he pointed out the story of, um, a young girl giving birth out just quietly, uh, and gave birth out in one of these Aboriginal tribes. Uh, and she's, you know, the baby was no, no hospital, nothing. She cut the umbilical cord with a, a rock and, um, the baby's healthy as can be. Now it, that was a healthy childbirth too. So again, modern medicine isn't bad, but I, I, I think we're seeing this switch in modern medicine back to um, maybe some of the, like breast milk, right, is good. <laughs> you know, uh, breastfeeding is good. It's better than formula. That, that kind of stuff is what I'm getting at. Is And that supports uh, a healthy microbiome, gut microbiome, okay? Um, and that the book he points out these specific times in life when we should really be focused on, um, you know, the gut microbiome. Early on in life, as much as possible, eating healthy foods, exposing the body to a lot of microbiomes, um, uh, again, I think this is more compli complicated than we think. Um, uh, watch my video on reductionism. I think why uh, modern science has really struggled um, in understanding things because it, it wants to reduce everything down to one simple variable. And uh, nutrition struggles with that. Supplements struggle with that. Oh, it's this one supplement because on some biochemical pathway, we had one rat study that says if I do the, more of this particular substance, then I get a, a, a positive and desirable outcome. That may not work, though, when you actually try to put it in a body that's eating different types of food and um, has a liver that destroys everything. And right. I mean, it's a little different. Okay. And this book points out mood matters, right? Don't eat when you're um, frustrated and you're um, strong. I mean, it, it promotes a negative health, uh, a gut biome. And he talks about the feeling of gut. Like I have a gut feeling, right? Where did that come? There's some connection to the brain there. That's the name of the book. Okay. The mind gut connection. Um, some of this will feel uncomfortable for, for those of you that are really immersed in scientific literature to the point where you know, um, bring me data and all the touchy feely crap. I don't really care about. That's fair. I have a I have a limit to that as well. But I I think we have to be careful. We don't fall into that reductionist trap where we just say I don't have any data. Therefore, um, I can't make any sort of um, any sort of creative uh, hypotheses on something. Right now, once you make that hypothesis, and you need to test it. You need to try to find a way to test it, and try to do it a way that isn't so reductionistic. That's freaking hard. <laughs> that's why good research is really hard to do. That's where randomized control trials are helpful, but they're still not perfect. Um, but that's the, you know, that, that's what this book I think does a good job of bringing out. And obviously I'm kind of rambling here, but 
as I'm talking through the book, I mean, again, these are the things you think about. It's like, well, maybe science falls short a little bit and maybe, you know, where you don't give enough credence to these ideas of a gut feel in this particular book. Um, and, but is that real? It's not just some, uh, you know, some, something in a movie that some guy, but it's a legitimate connection from the gut to the mind. And um, obviously we know that, you know, if you're stressed out and depressed, that affects your gut. Why would not the gut affect your mind? Okay. Uh, he points out the physiology associated. It's not some like, you know, mystic voodoo he's talking about. He talks about the vagal nerve and, um, you know, some of the instances uh, in the past where the vagal nerve has been cut and the consequences that arise from that. And this, it just, the book does a really nice job with that. I'm not, I, I'm not saying you have to buy all the, con like you can buy the book or not, I don't care, but you don't have to like buy into all the concepts in the book, but it's worth a read and it's worth um, thinking about. And again, if you haven't explored this area of the body and literature and topic, um, this is a great place to start. I think he does a really, a, a decent job of being balanced. He obviously has, a, um, you know, an interest in, uh, you listen to a story, he has a, a profound interest in this area of research and um, obviously he's practiced in this area. So, you know, he, he really believes that this is a significant part of health. Um, but I think he brings the receipts to, to both anecdotally and in the research literature to kind of show it and then explores that maybe we've typical modern, you know, the typical modern in the, in the mind of a modern is that, you know, everything has to be done um, in some sort of quantitative research study that brings statistical significance or it has no value. Um, and I don't, instead of looking at that type of um, input as a valuable part of a complete decision making, okay, um, research is important. I'm not, I, I review research article. I think they're valuable, but we also have to look at in the applied and we have to, I guess the point is we have to think critically. We have to build, we've got to the point where we just trust research literature and that's it. But no, the research literature and the people who are involved with doing research are supposed to be thinking critically about what they're doing. And if they're, if you're not able to do that, then you're going to be, find yourself in trouble. And I'll, I'll end with this. And this is going to sound a little arrogant and I don't mean it that way is that um, years ago when I first started reading research literature, I'm like, this is hard to understand, right? I mean, you got stats and all this. And I thought, you know, this is a good thing because it keeps it ha out of the hands of people that aren't ready to read it, right? And me included at times. There's some stats I don't understand. I don't, it's good. I shouldn't read it. Um, at, at least, in well, that's not true. I should read it, but I, I need to spend time understanding it. If you just lift the, the, you know, the answer off of an abstract or something, you haven't really explored the, the article. You need to read it critically. Uh, we are suffering in a time where we've become so lazy with reading research literature. We don't think critically about it and try to synthesize it and triangulate that data among other literature and our own experiences and the experiences of others <clears throat> that have expertise in the field. Um, just like those doctors, they sat around and they talked, right? Those were people that had credentials and they knew it, but they talked about and there was, there was some give and take and there were some um, those that had um, decisions that were contrary to others. And that's good. That's how you sharpen the information. That's how you gain insight. Um, and that includes being critical of research. Okay, that's enough rambling. It's a good book. Check it out. Ex explores the topic very well. Talks about it. Um, doesn't give any specific, which I like actually. It doesn't give you any, some magic bullets to fix your gut, but it does provide some hacks in terms of gut hacks, in terms of how to improve general gut health. Um, and that completely, really clearly highlights, you know, he mentions asking people, did they have a bad childhood and how that's linked? That, that was part of his questionnaire. Is, did, you know, did you have a good childhood? Yes or no? And if they didn't, more than likely they had some gut issues that were associated with um, how their gut was changed when they're young. And we've seen this show up in a lot of different areas, not just the gut, um, you know, type 2 diabetes, right? Uh, Non-obese uh, diabetes, right? And all these different things that were metabolism has been altered by how the mother um, was either under stress or not stress. I mean, there's been some interest in, um, you know, the, micro, uh, the microbiome and autism. And the stress the mothers are under, while, you know, while they're pregnant, all these they're very interesting areas, and I think they all give credence to the information that's promoted in this book. So, check it out. The mind gut connection, not the mind muscle connection. That's something else. That's a different author. Um, uh, you know, I hope you you'll give it a, a read. And if you've read in this area already, it'll probably be nothing new. Um, <clears throat> but if you haven't read a lot in this area or at all, you probably will find it valuable. Okay. See you next video.